Hi everyone, I'm Lucie Lalumière. I'm the president of Interactive Ontario. Uh, so first off, thank you all uh, for joining us today and I hope you're all keeping safe. Uh, so as you know, funding is even more important now than ever uh, through these trying times. Uh, we need our people to continue to work, to create uh, interactive digital media products and to commercialize them. Uh, so, so today, what we're going to do is go through the Ontario Creates uh, funding programs, uh, global affairs, uh, global assistance programs, as well as the CMF programs. Uh, and before uh, we start, I just want to thank you, uh, Ontario Creates, for being our presenting partner, and CMF and global affairs for being our event partners. So this is particularly important, uh, as I said, so we really appreciate that uh, you're doing this uh, from your home, so thank you very much. Uh, so the flow of the event is going to be, first off, Kim Gibson from Ontario Creates. She's going to present, uh, and then we'll have a Q&A. Uh, so the Q&A happens in the YouTube channel. So if you have any questions, uh, put them there, and Stephanie is going to go through them. Uh, and uh, when comes time from Q for Q&A, uh, Stephanie is going to ask questions. So after Kim, it's going to be Jeffrey Crossman from Global Affairs. Again, presentation, then Q&A. And then it's going to be Shelley Kaltish uh, from uh, Telefilm slash CMF. Same thing, presentation, then Q&A. And at the end, we'll have general question uh, for all. And if we have time at the end, uh, Interactive Ontario is doing a lot uh, with you. Uh, regarding the COVID crisis. So uh, if we have time, I'm going to talk a bit about this uh, and uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions uh, at the end as well. So without further ado, uh, Kim, uh, up to you. Thank you so much, Lucy. Um, it is a, a pleasure to be here today speaking to you all. I'm gonna kick this off by sharing a uh, my slide deck to all of you so you can see it. Uh, so as Lucy uh, indicated, my name is Kim. I'm a program consultant with the interactive, uh, with Ontario Creates, working on the Interactive Digital Media Fund. Um, and what I'm going to do today is walk you through very high level what this fund is. Uh, this is not a replacement for an information session. There's a limited amount of information that I can cover off in the time that we have available. So this is just going to be a high level bird's eye view of everything. Uh, before I get started, as Lucy's mentioned, we are all doing this from home. So there is a possibility that there where it will be some slight hiccups. So uh, before I get started, I would like to introduce you and my slide is up. Uh, here we go. I would like to introduce you to my team members here at the house who may be making some special guest appearances during uh, my talk. Uh, so we have Vegas, who is the Director of Demanding Food and Lots of Pets. We have Kismet, who is the Director of Afternoon Naps and Hiding in Warm Places. Uh, Fox, who is the Manager of High Jumping and Keeping People Awake, which he did last night. And Dash, who is the Coordinator of Ball Chasing and Park Visits. So if you do see them walking around in the background, they are supposed to be here and I don't live in the zoo. Um, so who are we here at Ontario Creates? That's who I am as a person. I have lots of pets. Uh, we are a government agency. We are part of the Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. And we uh, have a number of departments within uh, the agency. Uh, we have our business affairs and research group that acts as a catalyst and funds research projects. Uh, we uh, have the tax credits uh, department that runs a number of different media tax credits, including the Ontario Interactive uh, Digital Media Tax Credit, which is a non-refundable labor-based uh, tax credit that pays between 35 and 40%. Percent. Um, unfortunately, I am not an expert in the tax credit, so I won't be able to get into any level of detail with you, but uh, we do have people at the office who are happy to speak with you uh, if you have any questions or to give you an overview of that credit. Um, also within Ontario Creates, we have our industry development group, and that is the part of the agency that I work for, where we run uh, industry funds. And then uh, we also have housed the province's film commission, um, and the film commission is responsible for going out and providing service to uh, uh, films that are shooting in the province and selling Ontario as a destination location for people to come and shoot. 
Uh, we deal with six sectors that Ontario creates. We uh, focus on uh, book and magazine publishing, uh, film and television uh, production, and the music industries. Um, and then, of course, we also fund the interactive digital media space. Uh, and within that industry, we relate to different kinds of, of content producers. So uh, we, we see video game developers, web series creators, uh, mobile content developers, MR, VR, XR producers, um, and also digital publishing content creators. So we have a wide group of individuals that we relate, th relate to through our interactive digital media programs. Uh, the IDM Fund, which is what I'm going to speak to you about today, um, is a series of, of five programs. Uh, I'm going to focus most of this presentation on our concept and def definition and production programs because those are the ones that we have the soonest deadline for. It's on April the 6th. And it is our biggest ticket fund and the one that I think we are most well known for. But, but uh, before we go into... Uh, all of the details about concept definition and uh, production. I'm going to walk you through the other programs that we offer as well, just so you have a sense of the other things that we do beyond just our concept definition and production programs. So uh, we have a marketing support fund uh, that is open to companies that have received support through our production program. Um, companies in the marketing support program can receive up to $50,000, 75% cap. Um, and the purpose of the program is to increase the visibility and financial viability of the projects that we funded through production. Um, we also have a futures uh, program, which is one of the newer programs that we've recently uh, brought online. It is very specifically targeted at early stage interactive digital media companies that may not necessarily meet the requirements for the concept definition and production programs. Uh, we offer that program and partner with other organizations in the past. We've worked with the Hand-Eye Society. We've worked with Interactive Ontario. We've worked with, with Toronto. Um, and those organizations uh, work with us and on our behalf deliver a series of um, workshops to help companies prep so that they're in a position to come in with a competitive application for concept definition and production. So the program is very much focused on skills and knowledge transfer. Um, ultimately, the companies that uh, get through the end of the futures program are considered eligible to concept uh, definition and production. And so once you've participated in futures, even if you didn't meet the eligibility criteria in advance of starting the futures program, we consider you eligible for concept definition and production going forward. So if your company is in a position where you don't necessarily meet those requirements right now, we would direct you to the futures program because it's a great way to get ready for the pro for IDM fund and for concept and production, but it also means you're automatically eligible when you conclude it. Uh, we also have our global market development program, which uh, provides uh, support for companies that are going abroad uh, to pursue business and audience development opportunities. Companies that are successful in this program can receive up to 15,000 capped at 50%. Uh, we will relate to all kinds of different costs, so your travel costs, hotel, flight. Um, we will cover your registration costs and exhibition costs for uh, events. Uh, so that's another uh, big program for us, and we, um, uh, we often uh, see large groups of companies going through and getting support to travel abroad to do those uh, very uh, activities. Um, then finally, we have our industry development program and the industry development program uh, is open to organizations like Interactive Ontario, basically trade and event organizations. And we fund through their activities that are being offered by those trade and event organizations that will facilitate and, and act as a catalyst for business growth within uh, the interactive digital media sector. So some of the programs that we funded in the past, um, iLunch, uh, the series that we're participating in right now today. Um, Wordplay, which is an event that has uh, been offered by the Hand-Eye Society. We have supported uh, the Toronto Game Jam um, and we've supported uh, Toronto uh, Teal Web Fest. And so that's just a small sampling of the types of activities that we support through industry development. So um, you're probably wondering, when are the deadlines? Uh, and I'm happy to be able to share some good information for you. We have lots of deadlines coming up over the next little while. Um, I haven't put any information here about concept definition and production, because as I mentioned, we're going to cover that off in the rest of the presentation. Um, and we'll talk about deadlines then. 
Um, marketing support is an ongoing intake. Uh, we take applications uh, from production applications or production uh, participants as they're ready. Uh, the Futures program generally runs in September, October of 2020. Um, we haven't announced dates for that, but that usually comes out in and around the summer. Uh, we have a deadline coming up for our Global Market Development Program on May the 25th. Uh, so lots of time to prepare an application for that. And then our industry development program, uh, which wouldn't be something for companies, but more for event organizations and trade associations. Uh, we have deadlines coming up on March the 5th, July the 6th, and November the 5th. So we are right now at the beginning of our fiscal year, which means we have lots of deadlines coming up and lots of things to do. So let's get to the real, the real question, the big ticket items, our concept definition and production. Uh, act uh, programs. Uh, so these, we again also have deadlines coming up for these two programs. Our first deadline is on April the 6th. Uh, second one is on August the 24th. Uh, uh, concept definition, uh, you can receive up to $50,000 and we support early stage activities through uh, that program. We'll talk a bit more about what that means on the next slide. Uh, production, you can receive up to $250,000 and it's to support the creation of a market-ready product, a product that would be considered a release candidate at the end of the production cycle supported by Ontario Creates. The program is open to Ontario uh, IDM content creators, book and magazine publishers. We are platform agnostic, which means that in order to be eligible, um, you, all you need to do is have a content project that's being distributed on a platform, network, or device that is interactive. So through this program, we fund digital magazines, we fund e-learning projects, we fund web series, we fund video games, we fund all kinds of different things. So there aren't a specific type of content that we're looking for, we're really open. And if there's something that you have that is distributed on an interactive platform network and, uh, or device, and it is an, a content project, then it's, con it's conceivable that you could come in for support through the IDM fund. Uh, it is a non-refundable contribution, which means uh, you don't have to pay it back to us. Uh, it, there's a 50% uh, cap, so we will fund up to 50% of your budget, uh, maxed out at the dollar values for each particular program. Um, and we are a last-in fund, so that means that you need to have all of your financing confirmed in place prior to coming in and submitting an application. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll get into a little bit more detail about what it is exactly we're looking for. So concept definition is very open-ended. You basically need to propose the activities that you need to do so that you're going to be ready and your company's going to be ready to move into production on uh, your project at the end of the concept definition cycle. So the kinds of activities that we fund through concept definition include prototyping, uh, creation of pre-production documents, uh, pitch material, business plans, conducting research, really anything that you need to do to be able to say, yes, I'm ready to move into production is ultimately, it, we're, we're, we're happy to relate to it. Within the production uh, program, we are a little more prescriptive because the purpose of that program is to actually create a market ready product. So you're not necessarily defining specific activities here because the activities are to create a production project or create a, to produce a project to, to go into production. Um, what you do need to do is you do need to tell us a little bit about your project. And as I mentioned before, all kinds of different projects come into us, games, um, XR experiences, magazines, websites, web series. So uh, lots of opportunities there if you've got a content project that's on an interactive platform network or device. Um, we look at both eligibility on two levels. So we look at project uh, to make sure that the project is eligible. We also look at companies. So for projects, the content has to be a content, uh, a content project, or sorry, the project needs to be a content project, which means it needs to consist, consist of two or more of text, sound, or images. It needs to be suitable for an interactive platform network or device, and that needs to be the primary platform. Um, it also needs to be suitable for commercial exploitation. So there needs to be an intent to actually generate revenue from the project that you are coming in for support for. It's not something that you can just be giving away for free and not monetizing it. There needs to be some attempt to monetize it. Um, and it also needs to be targeted at either consumer um, audience, a magazine audience, or a student audience. What we don't do is we don't fund projects that are actually for use by corporations. 
Um, companies uh, that are eligible, you can be a new company, but there are specific requirements that you need to meet to be a new company. Um, in addition to meeting those requirements, we also require that new companies contact us in advance to go through the eligibility criteria so that we can ensure that you are in fact eligible for the program. Uh, we have established some expenditure and revenue tests that we use to determine whether existing companies are eligible. Um, and those are very clearly and specifically outlined in the guidelines, but very briefly, 50% uh, of your revenue needs to come from uh, publishing, book and magazine publishing activities. 50% uh, of your expenditures need to be associated with the production of interactive digital media content, or 25% of your revenue needs to come from the creation of screen-based content. So it's you don't have to meet all three of them. It's just one of those tests. If you meet one of those tests, then your company has passed the first threshold of eligibility. The next thing we need to see with companies that are applying is we do need to see that the company has uh, somebody on staff, an employee, who has a minimum of three years of full-time experience uh, working on interactive digital media content creation in a professional capacity. Um, so when we do do calls with clients, we will speak with them, one, about the expenditure and revenue tests, and then we will also go through the process of making sure that they do meet that requirement of having somebody with three years of full-time experience. Of course, uh, because you're applying to a government agency, we also require that the company be Ontario-based um, and Canadian-owned. Um, and as I mentioned previously, IDM Fund Futures applicants are fast-tracked into the program. So they may not necessarily meet the expenditure and revenue test. They may not have that full-time experience in-house, but they are considered eligible for the program. So if you are not eligible, that's a great way to kind of get yourself ahead and fast track yourself so that you will be. Um, our programs are competitive. So we do have very specific uh, valuation criteria that we are looking at when we're um, reviewing applications. They're very similar across both concept definition and uh, production. So I'm just going to walk you through kind of simultaneously both sides. You can see the percentages on either side of the screen. Um, but uh, track record of the applicant company and production team, we look at them both. So we want to see that you have some experience doing this before beyond just being able to actually uh, produce your product project, having experience commercializing project and having actually generated revenue and had success in market goes a long way within this program. Uh, because uh, we are, um, uh, our focus within the agency is on um, uh, economic benefit to the uh, province. Uh, we are very much focused on looking at things like how much money you're spending in the province, how much money you're spending on labor, how many jobs you're creating, how much other funding you're bringing to the table. And that is uh, evaluated and reflected in your benefit to the Ontario score. Uh, we will also be looking at the feasibility and project and accuracy of your document. So um, we look at your budget, we look at your schedule, we want to see that the project that you've proposed is actually achievable within uh, the constraints that you have. So with the money that you have available, with the schedule that you've outlined, that everything looks like it is feasible and there are no major risks associated with your project. And then, of course, we are looking at the quality, innovation and creativity of your project. I mean, the reality is that, well, we are looking to grow companies and while we are looking to um, create benefit in the Ontario economy, if you don't have a great project, you, you, you don't have anything. So it's particularly important that you have a really good, solid uh, project and that you're able to express it and communicate it and clearly convey the strengths within the application. Um, then uh, within the concept definition, we are looking more at the positive impact on company growth because after concept definition, there won't necessarily be revenues associated in the uh, with the project because the project is something that you're not necessarily releasing. It's something that you're creating so that you can get ready to move into your market release uh, production phase. So we're looking at things like... Um, does this project have a really good chance of actually going into production? So we're looking at whether support for the concept definition activities that you've outlined will produce benefit uh, to your company um, and whether it will have a good likelihood of going into full production. Um, and then within the production stream, we are basically looking at critical commercial success and the revenue that you can generate from your project. Um, in addition to those five core categories for um, evaluating the projects. We also provide uh, bonus uh, points to projects and to companies 
uh, that reflect diversity and gender parity or that uh, contain Francophone, Indigenous, or diverse elements. So it's really important in your application and there are sections of the application material where we do ask you to very specifically address that particular uh, content and, and you can get up to 10% uh, bonus for that content if, um, if you, uh, your project and your company reflects. Uh, this is a snapshot of what we had sort of last year. I find this information can be particularly useful to companies. So um, we're quite oversubscribed. Concept definition, we had a 30% oversubscription. Um, we had 89 applicants come into the program last year across the two deadlines. Um, that's actually a pretty high number for us. So there's been an increased demand in concept definition. Um, it's, I guess people are trying to, are figuring out what a great program it is. It's still relatively new for us because we've only been offering it for four or five years. Um, so we're finding, finally trying to, uh, starting to hit our stride um, and get a large number of applications in there. Um, games are our largest content category across the board in uh the concept definition and production funds. 63% of the projects that we saw in concept definition last year were uh, games. Um, the average grant was $40,000. So while the maximum contribution is 50, some people, lots of people are coming in and asking for less. So if you have a smaller project and you feel like it makes sense to come in and request a smaller amount, we are happy uh, to see uh, those applicants applications come in. Um, and then within the production stream, we had a 250% uh, over subscription. Um, similar to concept, we had 89 applications come in. So not sure why it was exactly the same, but it was last year. 44% um, are games. So still that is the largest content category, but um, they are no longer um, the majority within the fund. So we are seeing other kinds of projects come in. Um, and the average contribution, I'm sorry, it's actually blocked by my my little windows. I seven, I have 17 thousand I'm guessing is the average contribution um, so I apologies I can't see it because I've got some things blocking it from the zoom thing but I think it's 17,000 or whatever you see on the screen whatever the the, the change is so uh, one of the things that, that I do want to point out is uh, we do regularly within both the concept definition and production streams fund the same companies so they can come in uh, multiple times to uh, receive support um, but we also see new companies come in and be successful every deadline um, there's a, a significant number of sort of first-time applicants. So if you are a first-time applicant to the company, don't let that, or sorry, to the, the, the fund, don't let that dissuade you. Um, I do encourage you to uh, come in with an application. And this is where you get more information. If you have any questions, uh, you are welcome to send an email to idmfund.ontariocreates.ca. That is our general uh, email box. Um, my email address is up there as well. Uh, in addition to my colleague, Danielle, Danielle Hebert is my uh, colleague. Uh, we uh, split the fund. So my area focuses mostly on video games and Danielle works with web series producers, e-learning content creators, um, and, uh, and digital magazines. So um, if you have questions, reach out to us. If you're not sure who to reach out to, please uh, feel free to just email the IDM fund at Ontario Creates email address. Uh, thanks, Kim. Um, we do have a couple questions. Um, we have uh, a lot of the questions have been actually concerning the changes of deadlines if uh, Ontario Crates is open to extending them to certain companies who have had to reallocate uh, sources during COVID. Um, also, at, oh, yeah, sorry, go yeah, ahead. I'll just I'll, I'll address that. So at the moment, there is no plan to extend the get the deadline. The deadlines are set. We are moving at those deadlines because we feel that it's very important to get the funding out to the industry. Um, we, the only way we can do that is by getting applications in, reviewing the applications, processing them and setting up contracts and, and flowing the cash. So the more we delay the deadlines, the longer it's going to be for us to get the funding out. Um, also, we've had significant calls, uh, not a significant number of calls. There's been no drop off in the level of interest that we've been seeing. We expect to have the same number of applications that we normally do. Uh, great, and another question in terms of, I believe it's the diversity program, is it gonna be continuing on? Um, they were told, there was people speaking about, you know, was the last intake last year and has the program been renewed? 
Um, so I believe what that person is asking about is a program that we offer on uh, a diversity program that's a, a different program. It isn't part of the Interactive Digital Media Fund. We do have the diversity bonus, but it's not part of that. It's not part of the IDM fund. I think what they're talking about is something that is related to our film uh, fund. So the diversity bonus holds, but there isn't an additional set of funding available. It's not a separate program. Great, and I just had one, uh, another question just popped through. Um, when evaluating other sources of funding for eligibility, does self-funding count? Uh, for example, uh, if someone's doing contract work part-time to sustain themselves. Yes, so you can include, we do look at self-funding. Um, the challenge with our program is that we do require that you have all of the financing in place. So you would need to have cash in bank to put up as part of your financing plan. What we can't do is we can't look at future revenues or future income. It has to be income that you've saved up and that you're applying to the project. Great, everyone seems to be pleased with the answers. Um, if anyone else Excellent. has any other questions, please put them through and we can forward them at the end of uh, the presentations. So our next uh, speaker that's up is uh, Shelley Coltish from the Dep who is the Deputy Director of Telefilm Canada. Sorry, I just had to unmute. Hi. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Shelley Coltish. I'm the Deputy Director uh, at Telefilm Canada in the CMF Program Administrator um, Department. Um, just so you understand the difference, um, CMF uh, Canada Media Fund uh, is the fund that I'm discussing today and it's administered at Telefilm Canada. Um, so I am actually at Telefilm, but I administer Canada Media Fund programs. It's a little complicated, but that's how it works. Um, so I'm going to bring up my PowerPoint. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention before I bring it up is that we are actually at the end of our fiscal year today. Uh, our fiscal year runs from April 1st to March 31st, and the CMF is going to be releasing all their new guidelines and deadlines um, this week, uh, but we don't have them yet. So I am presenting to you all of the information we have for last year. However, um, what I have been told is that there will be some minor changes, but for the most part, what I'm telling you is what will be happening. Uh, the same programs will be happening uh, in this new fiscal year. So um, you can go to the CMF website and you can sign up for uh, email updates so that you will get an email when they post all the, the new deadlines and guidelines for the coming year. Uh, they also publish a summary of changes document so you can go quickly. Instead of hunting through the new guidelines to see what were the changes, you can go to this document and see specifically what are the changes for each program so that you can get a summary really quickly fast. Um, but for the most part, everything will be relatively the same. So um, let's proceed with the PowerPoint. Uh, share my screen. Here we go. All right. So, um, so I'm going to talk about the experimental stream funding and our international co-production and co-development funding, which also uh, allows for digital media projects. Uh, all right, is this going to work? One sec. <laughs> it doesn't want to move forward. Uh, next. Okay, it didn't want to do it with my, ah, here we go. Okay. Um, so the CMF receives, uh, is a federal fund, um, and it receives money from the Department of Canadian Heritage and uh, cable subscription providers called broad broadcaster distribution units. Um, the objective of the Canadian, the Canada Media Fund is to support the creation of Canadian audiovisual content for all platforms, television and digital media, um, and to support innovation and leading edge projects. So last year, as you can see, the budget for the entire year was approximately $353 million. Uh, so how that breaks down is in the experimental stream last year, approximately $48 million was um, put towards the experimental programs. Um, we've funded since 2010, over $300 million in projects, over 900 projects. Um, and then the bulk of the money is uh, approximately $304 million uh, goes towards television programs and their related digital media projects. So I won't be talking about the television programs uh, money today, uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to email me about that. 
Um, so the experimental stream programs essentially fund interactive content, interactive web series, websites, eBooks, VR, XR, AR experiences, console, web, mobile, VR games, uh, apps, software, and enabling technologies. Um, and and uh, we've been also getting AI as well lately. Um, the, these stats are a little old, but um, as you can see, for the most part, a lot of the funding goes to games. Um, but uh, there's quite a lot in rich interactive media, some in software, and then the web series is a little smaller because that is a new fund that has only been open for three years. Um, but uh, that has its own fund, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, so for the bulk of the experimental pro um, program funding, I will so subtract web series for now because I will have another slide. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Okay. Sorry, I just heard myself repeated in an echo in the background. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to subtract web series from this. I have another slide for that. But for the bulk of the experimental funds, uh, like I mentioned, they're for games, software, mobile apps, rich interactive media. Um, there are essentially four stages uh, for new clients, really just three. Uh, so we have um, conceptualization. This is the only one of our programs that is first come, first serve, and it's brand new. And it is meant for brand new clients to the fund who have never received experimental funding before. Uh, so this fund is uh, for if you are pre-prototyping and you need some money to do some research development, um, various uh, steps prior to putting in a prototyping application. Um, you can apply for this first come first serve fund. Um, the deadline this year will likely be around September. Uh, and I'll get into a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, our, our second stage is prototyping. And, and I should preface this by saying you don't need to apply for each stage. If you've already finished, you know, let's say you're prototyping already, you could come straight to production. Um, so prototyping, of course, is to create a prototype. Um, and then production, um, your prototype should be complete. Um, you should be able to submit um, a link to show us your prototype. Um, and it's to complete the entire project to release to the market. And within your pro production budget, you need to have your full marketing budget ready. Um, there are two streams in production in prototyping you don't need to decide yet but in production you need to decide whether you're going to apply for the innovation stream uh, which is about innovation in content or technology or the commercial stream which is about um, return on investment essentially um, and then for projects that are older uh, you can apply for marketing separately uh, prior to 2018-2019 uh, we used to um, only fund production with one year worth of marketing. And so you had to apply separately for your marketing. So we've kept that stream open for projects that uh, did not get a full marketing request in the past. Um, but for new clients, in, if you apply to production, you would be expected to put a full marketing budget within that application. Um, so we, do, we don't do grants. Uh, our money either comes in the form of an advance or an investment. Uh, we don't invest in companies, we invest in projects on a project per project basis. Um, for the conceptualization, the only one uh, out of these funds that is first come first serve, it is a repayable advance up to $15,000 uh, or 75% of your total costs, whichever is less. Um, for prototyping, um, which is uh, all the rest of our funds are selective. Uh, they're either internally scored by our content specialists or we hire an international jury for the production funding. Um, in prototyping, you can ask for up to $250,000 or 75% of your budget, whichever is less. In production, which includes your marketing costs, you can ask for up to $1.5 million, again, with the 75% cap. And in limited marketing and promotion, if you have an older project that did receive production in the past, uh, you can ask for up to 400,000. Um, so as you can see, we don't fund 100% of the project. We only fund up to 75%. So you are expected to let us know where the other 25% is coming from. So that could be a variety of things, um, producer investment, uh, possibly other funders, possibly telling us that you're going to get tax credits. Um, but if you have any questions about that, you know, send them through. Um, so eligibility for our funds. Uh, to be eligible for the uh, experimental funds, your project has to be significantly interactive or highly immersive. 
um, or it ha and and sorry, not or and it has to be connected to the cultural sector. So what does the cultural sector mean? Well, essentially, it means arts and entertainment. So if it's an, a game, it's generally always eligible. Um, what we're trying to do is weed out projects for other industries. So we're not funding software for medical use or um, technology and research. Um, but uh, if it's connected to arts and culture in some way, then it would be eligible. Um, what I would suggest is if you have something that you do not know if it fits that criteria, uh, rather than just take a chance, please call us and do a, a pre-application consultation to discuss um, whether or not your project might fit that criteria. And uh, I will give you the contact information at the end about that. Um, so we do have a web series fund as well. Uh, there's several web series funds in Canada. Ours is specifically for second seasons or later. Uh, so if you have a brand new web series, we're not for you. Uh, you go to Belfon IPF, and I guess Ontario Creates as well. I didn't put their logo in there. Um, it uh, For our fund, though, it's second seasons or later. It should be a web series that was successful previous to application for us. Uh, because we do look at your analytics as part of the scoring uh, and, and critical success and awards and some, so on and so forth. Um, you can ask for up to 60% of your budget or $250,000, whichever is less. And it is a recoupable investment, not a grant. Um, so, and, and we only fund drama, comedy, children's and youth or documentary. Um, so as with the other funds and the other experimental funds, none of our funds are a grant. So the ones that are labeled advances would end up getting repaid at a certain point or rolled into the investment if you come in for production funding later. Um, and the investment would, I'm not going to get into the details, but essentially we would get a percentage of your gross revenues is how it works. Um, who is eligible for the CMF? So it's a it's for the entire country, but uh, you must have a for-profit Canadian corporation. You don't have to be incorporated to apply, um, but you do need to eventually incorporate a company uh, for us to contract with you if you're selected. Uh, and the um, the company must be considered Canadian controlled. Uh, so you can be a permanent resident of Canada. Um, however, there are certain rules surrounding that. So if you've been a permanent resident for too long, it could put you offside. So if you're questioning whether or not you're Canadian controlled, again, call us for a pre-application consultation to discuss whether your company will be eligible or not. Um, head office has to be based in Canada. And then alternatively, broadcasters are eligible to apply as well. Um, so you can actually, as a foreign applicant, you can apply for, I mean, you technically you can't apply for the CMF funding. However, you can work with a Canadian producer using a co-production or co-development uh, through the framework for international digital media co-production. Uh, it will only put money, you can only apply for money towards the Canadian side of your financing. But if you are in co-production with a foreign company, um, you can structure it in a way where you would your project would be eligible to apply to CMF. Um, I won't get too much into detail about that because it's it's a bit complex. But if you have questions about that again, um, I would definitely schedule a pre-application consultation with us. Um, oh, that's too much. Um, we also have international incentives. Um, so these are some of the places we've worked with in the past. Some of them are for television, but a lot of them, I'd say the bulk of them are for digital media projects. So if you are working with producers in another country, uh, some of the, uh, we do have some matching funds with organizations in other countries, um, which might be of interest to you. So if you, if you want to talk about any of those, um, please give us a call. Um, I'll just go back to the experimental funds. So like I said, they're scored internally and or by an international jury. So the breakdown of the points is that you get scored based on your team, your content, your financial viability, which includes looking at your budget, your schedule, your financial plan, um, your financial stability of your company, and also on your strategic positioning and marketing. Uh, each score is broken down in different ways depending on whether you're applying for prototyping or production. Uh, certain weights are heavier depending on which stage you're in. Um, and then as far as deadlines go, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna go to my contact information. So the deadlines ha will be released this week. Like I said, sign up for email updates uh, if you'd like to know um, what's going on next year. 
Um, there will be some minor changes. Um, the deadlines are going to be pretty much the same as they were last year. Um, so in general, prototyping is usually around mid-May and mid-October, and production will usually be uh, innovation production and commercial production usually will be approximately earlier May, but close to mid-May uh, and uh, mid-September-ish. Um, so you can plan for that. Uh, you will know specifically the dates this week when they actually do post them. Um, so uh, here's my contact information. That's my phone number, my email address. There is also, uh, I should type this so that you can I don't know if I can do this while it's being shared. Oh, darn it. I've done something bad. One second. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, but uh, the uh, there is a general email address that you can send questions to our coordination department. Um, that is cmf.fmc.coordination at telefilm.ca. Um, I can type that somewhere on a Word document and share it later if somebody would like me to put that up on the screen during the Q&A. Um, but that's, uh, that's essentially what it is. So that's it. And uh, I'm open to questions. Thanks, Shelley. If you actually want to type it into the Zoom chat, I can, oh, can I? put it into okay. the YouTube chat for everyone who's watching there. Okay, I will do that right now. So Perfect. it's it's a brand new email address. We used to have one that was um, info at telefilm.ca, but that goes to all of Telefilm um, for every program they have. So this one is specifically for CMF programs, and it'll go directly to the coordinators handling our programs, so you'll get a faster answer. Um, and like I said, I encourage people to call us and have a phone conversation about their project if they're wondering about eligibility of either their company or their project. Um, and uh, we can also talk to people about the application process and, and how to sign up for our application portal and, uh, and what we're expecting to see in an application. And we're happy to take those calls. Great. I just had a, a quick question in terms of you did speak about the deadlines will be going online. Um, someone was specifically asking about the German Canadian incentive and if there is more information will be also posted at the exact same time, I guess, mm -hmm. in the next week or so. So, um, no, with the international incentives, they tend to be posted throughout the year as we renew those partnerships. Um, I did have a call from somebody a few weeks ago saying that there's a date up on the German median board, Berlin Brandenburg website. That's not our that's not our international incentive. That's one of their own funds. So the April 7th deadline posted on their website is not for the program that we do. Um, generally, it's usually around the same time every year, but I can't guarantee it. Well, I mean, I can't guarantee, first of all, that the partnership will be renewed or, you know, that the deadline will be the same. But if it is, usually it's in September. So there's some time for that. But um, yeah, all the deadlines that get posted are generally for our domestic programs, just for Canadian producers and the international ones get posted throughout the year as we renew the partnerships and decide on the deadlines. So again, another reason to sign up for email updates because <laughs> you'll get the press release when it is done. Uh, I had a couple questions about people who are working on uh, VR and AR projects. Um, mm -hmm. For the financed activities in the experimental innovation and commercial funds, what percentage of those games are funded uh, that are actually VR, AR? That's really hard to say. Um, <laughs> I don't have stats on me, but uh, I, I would say definitely there's, you know, been a steady increase in VR, AR games, you know, over the last four or five years. Um, I, I wouldn't want to say a stat because I honestly don't know, but quite a lot. And then there's a question in terms of going back to COVID. Um, will uh, funding for projects that are in the LBE space, uh, location-based entertainment, be limited um, versus at-home VR that people are producing? Um, not to my knowledge. Uh, I mean, I know that LBE games are having some issues now because they can't launch um, or they have to shut down if they had launched uh, until this crisis is over. But uh, for now, our deadlines are staying the same. We're not telling LBE projects not to apply. They're absolutely welcome to apply and they will not be, you know, there will be no bias towards funding them at all. Um, 
we're basically business as usual in, in, in terms of the deadlines. Like Kim was saying, OMDC, or sorry, Ontario Creates. I'm never going to stop saying that. <laughs> um, but uh, we're not pushing the deadlines for the experimental funds because um, that would delay money coming into companies and the companies need this money to uh, go forward. And so while we understand that there may be deadlines and launches of LBE projects, uh, we will not be delaying any of the deadlines to apply for funding. Okay, and a uh, question, um, if someone is currently working on a prototype to complete an academic program, um, but with a plan to further develop it in a, com a professional capacity, what level of program would they qualify for? I would probably need more information about that. Uh, we don't fund projects um, for individuals in an academic program. Uh, if somebody is, though, developing it professionally outside of their university, um, with their own for-profit incorporation. Uh, we can talk about that. Um, I'd need a little more details on the development history to really be able to answer that. Okay, and uh, one more question. Um, so an interactive website, um, which, you know, software as service, um, would they be eligible to, uh, I believe, let me just read the question here. They're, they're essentially creating content and they're supporting the sector and producers and festivals. Would they be eligible for any um, funding? Uh, yeah, uh, I would suggest a pre-application consultation for a project like that. We have allowed some software as a service, um, you know, software for use in the cultural sector. Uh, certainly that's been eligible. Um, if the pro if the project is purely transactional uh, and it's it's being developed just for their own business and not for the industry, uh, then uh, it could be an issue. But uh, uh, certainly if you're developing software for the industry to use, that uh, could be eligible. But I would suggest a pre-application consultation. Great, I think that's all the questions uh, we have right now. Um, our next speaker is Jeffrey Crossman, who is the Trade Commissioner for Global Affairs. Hello, Jeffrey Crossman here. Uh, thank you uh, everyone for the presentations. Um, as mentioned, I work for Global Affairs Canada as a trade commissioner. So you've probably heard a lot of Global Affairs Canada in the news these days. The trade commissioner service is part of uh, uh, our department and I'll just pull up my slide now. So there. So, um, I'll get into more about me. Maybe I'll start uh, talking about you as clients. Uh, so, and just how uh, the support mechanisms that the Trade Commissioner Service has. You've heard two presentations with regard to production funding, although I do know that Ontario Creates and Telephone Canada also have programs to support export. Uh, the Trade Commissioner Service is 100% dedicated to supporting expert exports, and uh, I'll run you through uh, what we can offer. So first off, just in terms of client definition, um, we looked for uh, Canadian companies or organizations uh, that are based in the community, have economic ties to Canada, uh, can uh, support Canada's economic growth and are export ready. So these are terms that we use inside. It's quite flexible when it comes to funding programs. There's a little bit more with regard to um, what we're looking for, but uh, with regard to who is a client, this would be, uh, I guess, the best way of describing or at least giving you a good overview. Um, normally I talk about the value chain. Um, instead, what I just like to focus here is, I cover the creative industries. So I cover film, television production, interactive media companies, music, publishing, music, sound recording and performance, book, periodical, performing arts, etc. So, <clears throat> quite a few sectors to cover uh, and interactive media is one of the latest sectors that have taken on. So go back. So speaking again, back to me, I'm based here in Toronto. Uh, our offices are right downtown and uh, we also have offices across Canada. So I know that the audience that I'm speaking to uh, are members of Ontario Creates 
However, just to say that uh, we do have trade commissioners across Canada, each one covering various sectors, and we do have people covering the, covering, uh, the creative industries as well. So I'll jump to colleagues just to say that working with my colleagues, hold on, here we go. I have colleagues around the world in um, uh, 175 offices and they provide services as well. Mostly what I do here in Canada is what we call preparation for international markets. So it's providing you with advice, looking at your export strategy, uh, looking at different programs that you're eligible for and kind of packaging up uh, the information that you have and your export strategy, and then I work to connect you. So my colleagues at POST are also there to provide market potential assessment, so information intelligence. They often, um, because they live in the community or in the country that you're targeting, they hear about uh, different possibilities. They make it uh, their business to meet other uh, contacts, etc., publishers, and then provide this identification of client, qualified clients to you. So in a nutshell, uh, I would work with the client here in Canada, then I would evaluate and connect you to the right person at my offices abroad, and then they would connect you to qualified contacts. <clears throat> so mentioning the contacts, uh, th that they will connect you to. We're looking, the end result that we're looking for is client success. So we've defined for ourselves client success in two ways. One is non-financial. So this can be, for instance, a non-disclosure agreement, or if you're working with another organization, you may not have um, exchanged money, but at least you now have a contract or some kind of agreement. We look at that as an um, intermediate success point uh, with the goal, hopefully, of you having a financial success. And we like to report on these, uh, mainly because, uh, well, just today's our fiscal end of year and I'm writing up a lot of success stories because we do a lot of reporting. We report back to Parliament uh, so that uh, they can continue financing this program. And speaking of financing, uh, we do have three funding programs They've, uh, in the past six months, been rebranded as Can Export SME, Can Export Associations, and Can Export Innovation. So, uh, Can Export SMEs is a program available for, in this case, you must be for profit and incorporated and have at least $100,000 in revenue in your, last, in your last tax year. This program can um, provide up to uh, $75,000 funding to cover 75% of your international market development activities. Um, so the categories of expense are travel, uh, the cost of going to conferences or trade shows, uh, as well as the cost of uh, changing your marketing material into the uh, target country's local language. So that could be uh, translating and uh, yes, translating and producing marketing pieces. It could be video, it could be um, uh, anything that uh, supports you in selling to that market. There's also money available for um, IP protection as well as uh, local consultants. Unfortunately, with uh, the travel restrictions currently on, um, the uh, Ken Expert is not entertaining applications for travel or for conferences at this time. The program is open and uh, there is no deadline. It's a rolling deadline. They will provide you with an answer within 60 days. However, for the moment, um, I would recommend taking a look at the, uh, the program, preparing your application for the eventuality that it will be open for travel and conference fees. We also have Can Expert Associations. So this is for not-for-profit incorporated associations. Uh, and we provide funding to these associations to in turn put on either trade missions outside of Canada, bringing in buyers to Canada or doing um, uh, training or research with regard to exports for their members. Finally, there's Can Export Innovation. It's a program to support Canadian innovators uh, meet with a partner
So Jeffrey, are you back? Yes, sorry about that. Okay, no worries. Bandwidth issues. Go ahead. So that's the, the end of my presentation. I'm ready for questions. Uh, I can also uh, supply people with links to these, uh, the variety of programs, as well as my uh, email address. Just opening. All right, and just having some technical difficulties on my side. <laughs> Maybe we broke the internet. So meanwhile, I'm going to ask you a question, Jeffrey. So you did talk about the impact of COVID on the programs uh, in terms of travel. Uh, so can you elaborate a bit more on the type of activities uh, <laughs> that people can submit? I know you mentioned a bit, but if you could elaborate, that would be really helpful. Well, uh, I'm recommending, uh, for instance, continue uh, with clients to continue with their export plans, um, be they evergreen. Uh, right now, we may not be traveling, but there is the possibility, well, of course, uh, markets will open, and perhaps think about where you're targeting uh, to, uh, what markets you target uh, in the future, and then developing your marketing materials now. That could be a project that could be covered by can export right now. Additionally, uh, depending on where you are targeting, you could be looking, for instance, into IP protection and the cost of having somebody validate or register your um, projects in the local market. So that again would be something that could be covered. So there are some things that can be done now uh, while we wait until the travel restrictions are off. Most of the time, clients in, in, in regular non-crisis time, they would apply for attending, most of the time it's conferences, so uh, game developers, uh, example, or G-Star. And so they would put together a slate of um, trade shows, markets, conferences that they are targeting, and then put that into one application. Uh, as I said, I know Ontario Creates has also a program to support travel to uh, markets around the world. I think that has a once a year deadline and covers up to 50%. This, as I mentioned, is a rolling deadline. So uh, you can apply at any time. Just be knowledgeable that the processing time is now 60 working days. It was 25 last summer, then it went to 40 in the fall, uh, and now it's 60. Uh, they're hoping to cut that down. And uh, what I'm recommending again to clients is to have their application ready because the moment that um, the travel um, directives have been removed, I would recommend having the uh, application ready and then hitting send in the system. That way you'll go right to the top. This program is available to all sectors of the economy. So anyone who is in the automotive business, clean tech, uh, forestry, soybeans, etc. So I'm pushing my creative industries clients to get in there first. And just a, a quick question: um, Would the cost of localization of a product in this particular question, a video game, um, not just the marketing materials, but would that be eligible under the Can Export SME funding? Good question. Uh, unfortunately, not. Uh, the program is not for anything related to production, including versioning. Uh, it's, uh, it applies to costs that relate to getting your marketing pieces in this case. So, for instance, if you had a sizzle reel and you wanted to recut it uh, or uh, dub it or get, you know, or something to that effect, yes, you could, uh, but not for the actual product and versioning itself. And will there be support for um, online connections of international markets? Uh, you talked about dubbing, but per, you know, perhaps translation services for reaching out to foreign games platforms. Yes. Uh, so uh, translation of marketing materials, yes. Uh, 
simultaneous interpretation, yes. So having somebody uh, interpret while you're talking with a foreign buyer, that's also an eligible cost. Great. Um, I just had an, a, a couple other questions um, that kind of popped up in between and, and I, other people might be able to also speak to this. Um, can interactive projects that were created essentially instantly uh, around three weeks ago um, that is helping an industry to continue to train students uh, due to COVID, can they apply for all these funds uh, retroactively? Um, I'll speak for CMF. We generally don't fund things retroactively, um, but certainly send your inquiry to us and we can take a look at it. But uh, we, we tend to fund projects that are new projects. We don't fund things that are retroactive. Uh, and from Ontario Crete's perspective, the answer is the same. Unfortunately, uh, Global Affairs Trade Commissioner uh, with regard to can export the same as well. I'm just going to uh, ask the person who asked the question to contact us because we really want to understand uh, more about this uh, as we may be able to uh, do something about it. Uh, I think that's all the questions that we have uh, right now. Um, Lucy, if you wanted to speak to, uh, for those of you who want to stick around, we're going to be talking a little bit about the uh, impacts of COVID-19 on the interactive digital media industry and potential stimulus and relief measures. And just before that, uh, Kim, Shelley, Jeffrey, anything else that you want to add that you, uh, you know, you thought, oh my God, I should have mentioned this. No. Well, any, sorry, well, go ahead, Jeffrey. I was giving, uh, waiting my turn. Uh, what I found with Can Export is um, it, it's, it's a government program. It may not be clear to everyone uh, some of the terminology. So I'm always available to meet with uh, the client, you beforehand, uh, before your application, get to know you. It also looks good because that way I can. Um, one of the questions in your application in, in the application is, are you currently working with the trade commissioner service? And if so, who? So it just, it demonstrates that you have an understanding, or at least I hope that you'll have an understanding after we meet together. So uh, that's my offer is that um, we, well, nowadays I'm, I'm quite flexible with phone meetings, with webinars, et cetera. So we can do that in advance, uh, help you uh, kind of focus down what you plan to do what, you know, my advice, et cetera. As I mentioned, I also have colleagues around the world. Some of, they of course are all working from home. So co connectivity issues are there. They're also being pulled in to do consular support because we have a million Canadians outside of Canada that want to come home. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of limited um, bandwidth in terms of mental bandwidth uh, on their part. But again, I would be pleased to meet with you, connect you whoever, to whoever you want. So I guess that would be my, my little final bit. And uh, a question I always ask, uh, Kim and Shelley, you've heard me ask you that. What's a major, please don't do this, uh, that you want to convey to people and a major, well, if you do that, that's going to help. Okay. Uh, well, for, for CMF, I would definitely say, and uh, like I said, you know, the all the new stuff will be posted shortly this week. Uh, there's nothing up there right now. But um, for all of our funds, we have a required document checklist and a budget template. Um, please use those and follow them exactly. Um, because if you try to freestyle your application and do it your own way, that, that will not serve you well. It needs to be done in the way that we say in the required documents checklist. Um, and in, in the back of the required documents checklist, it also has a like field by field, like what our application portal wants you to type in that field. So if you're at all confused, you just consult that. Uh, so I would say the most important thing is to download the guidelines Take a look at the scoring grid and see, you know, what you're going to be evaluated on and then use our required documents checklist and then do your budget as per our budget template. Um, and don't try and make your own documents. And uh, if you have any questions about any of that, please just call us um, and we can have a discussion. 
Lucy, can I say something? It's Kim. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I, I agree with everything Shelly has said. Just a couple of things to add. Um, I guess the don'ts, I, as I'm thinking of the things I'm gonna say, the don'ts are kind of the same as the, the opposites of the do's. Um, so do make sure that you reach out and call us. Uh, we are here to help you. That's what we want to do. We wanna help you come in with the strongest possible application. We wanna see the best projects. We wanna review the best applications. So contact us. Um, the don't um, is don't leave it to the last minute. Don't, mm. don't, it, these things do take time to put together. Um, most of the work that you're going to do when you're filing an application, if you're serious about going into production and into sort of a concept definition phase, you are going to use the documents that you prepare as part of the application. So it's not a waste of your time to do them, but it does take time. So make sure that you're budgeting sufficient time. If you're just finding out about this program now and you're like just thinking, oh, I'm going to put together a production application for April the 6th it's very unlikely that you'll be able to put together a solid application. Generally, we estimate it takes about a week of full-time work um, spread over however many weeks you have and about two weeks of full-time work uh, for concept definition and production respectively. So make sure you're leaving yourself sufficient time to prepare the documentation because when you don't, it shows. Exactly. Yeah. Same for us. Stephanie, was there any other questions? Uh during that bit of discussion. Uh, there was a question uh, for Jeffrey. What are the dollar amounts uh, that range for support? Uh, can you please repeat the question? Uh, what are the dollar amounts, the, the range for support for different uh, programs? For can export SMEs, mm -hmm. yes. it's up to $100,000 per organization. And the program covers 75% of your costs. So if you have travel, conference fees, uh, translation, interpretation fees of, uh, I guess that would be, you know, of 133,000, then you pay the 33 and the 100,000 is covered by Can Export. Did you hear that? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yes, thank uh, any, you. Stephanie, anything else? Uh, no, not right now. Okay. No, no, did, did you hear what I said? Yes. 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 Thank you. Yes. Yeah. You see, one Wait. last thing, and I think uh, I've heard it from Kim, I've heard it from Shelly, and you've all heard it from me. We want you to succeed, and we want you to have success. So, uh, you know, as said, let's talk and make sure that you have the time and the feedback to get a really good application in. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Kim and your cats. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Vincent uh, from LifeCast and to our partners, Ontario Creates, CMF and Global Affairs. So this is the end of the formal part of the session. Uh, you're free to uh, stay on the line. I'm going to brief you on what IO is doing uh, during the COVID-19 crisis, how we work with you. Uh, and uh, so thank you to our panelists. This was fantastic. Uh, thank you. And in fact, ah! <laughs> all right. Uh, and by the way, to the panelists, if you have to go, uh, totally fine as well. Uh, so we've been very busy uh, as all of you uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, I've been talking uh, to many uh, companies in our industry, freelancers as well. Uh, our board directors have been very engaged as well in talking with you. So we got a lot of feedback on the impact of the crisis on your companies, uh, as well as anticipated impact. So we're all in the same situation right now. We don't know how long is it going to last. Uh, and obviously the anticipated impacts uh, will depend on uh, the length of the crisis. Uh, but by gathering all of this information, we made preliminary recommendations to the provincial government last week. Uh, this is on our website in the news section. Uh, where we've, we have also posted it on social media. Uh, so basically those recommendations, uh, they have two main goals. Uh, the first goal, uh, is what are the relief measures uh, that can help the industry? 
And those were very much related to uh, the announcement that the federal uh, made, in fact, regarding the wage subsidy. At the time, it was still 10%. Uh, now, since then, uh, it's been up to 75%. Uh, we're still awaiting for more details, though, to understand better the eligibility uh, of the companies. Uh, but that was one thing uh, that we said in terms of relief measure. Uh, the other thing uh, was that we support the creation of a fund to help companies uh, in all sectors uh, deal with the additional costs of sending employees at home and setting them properly uh, to work. Uh, so those two were the main relief measures uh, that we discussed. But in addition to that, we also uh, talked about recovery uh, measures. And one of them, I guess, uh, is a bit of a relief measures as well. So one thing we said uh, is for the tax credit, YDMTC, uh, please let's take this uh, time to accelerate uh, the process time for OIDMTC. Uh, so we said, if we can make sure that the low risk files and the companies that have a track record uh, are automatically approved, that would help uh, with bringing the money sooner uh, into the companies. Uh, we've also heard from some of you uh, that the CRA right now is not processing OIDMTC files. So we've raised that. If you hear that, uh, I need to know, and we need to know, so uh, please contact me. Uh, in fact, I'm going to repeat that throughout. Please contact us, and you can contact me personally as well at lucy at interactiveontario.com with feedback. Uh, the other um, recovery and stimulus measures that we talked about, uh, their goal is to make sure that we don't lose too many jobs permanently in the industry. Uh, I think many of us know that in Ontario, we are on a growth trajectory. However, we have many, many small companies and many of them uh, have only existed for five years or, or less. Uh, about 36%, in fact, have been created uh, within the last five years. Uh, so we are vulnerable because we don't have reserves. Uh, and uh, basically, a lot of uh, the companies also depend on FIFA service work. And uh, some of you have told me they've already seen contracts uh, being either canceled or suspended. Uh, so there's vulnerability. So we have to make sure that whatever we do over the next few weeks and months, we don't lose too many jobs permanently and companies permanently in the industry. So we can, when this, uh, this crisis, uh, is over, uh, not backtrack years back, but continue and grow and position Ontario as the leader that we were uh, becoming before uh, COVID. Uh, so in terms of the preliminary recommendation that we made, uh, we have uh, recommended to increase uh, the amount of funding for IDM fund. Uh, this would allow uh, more projects uh, to be produced, more jobs to be maintained, and more products to be released in the market. Uh, we've recommended that the cap be moved from 50% to 75% for this fiscal year. Uh, we've also recommended that live ops uh, be eligible for funding under IDMF. Uh, the other thing that we said is that uh, marketing is going to be critical. Uh, so we have uh, games and interactive digital media products that have been created that have high potential uh, for commercialization, it's time to put more marketing dollars behind them. So we've recommended to up uh, the funding under IDMF uh, for marketing from 50K to 250K. Uh, so all of those recommendations, you can find them on our website. Uh, and the other thing that we also said is that we uh, have expertise in the industry to create interactive digital media products that can help uh, other sectors in their recovery effort, uh, whether it's tourism, uh, museum, education, healthcare, we have a lot of expertise uh, to help those other sectors. So uh, what we said, there could be a fund created uh, for our industry to work with all other sectors to create those interactive digital media products that will help uh, with the recovery effort. 
So again, you can find those recommendations on our website. More, uh, and we've uh, submitted them to uh, Minister McLeod. Uh, she's our minister for heritage, sport, tourism, and culture industries. We're meeting with her uh, this week, and we've also socialized our recommendation to all uh, stakeholders in government agencies and outside of government as well. So what's really important now is that uh, we all know the situation is fluid. Uh, it changes uh, hour by hour. Uh, so we need to continue to receive your feedback so we can tweak, tailor the recommendation uh, as per the situation. Uh, so we have partner uh, with our colleagues across Canada, uh, with NI Society, uh, with the CMF, uh, and Nordicity uh, on a survey that is in the field right now. Uh, many of you probably have received uh, an email blast about the survey. It's critical that you fill it. We need to understand what's happening in your company. Obviously, the information is remain, uh, will remain confidential and it's going to be aggregated. But we need to understand the impact and we need to understand what relief and stimulus measures would be the most effective. And we need to understand what we Interactive Ontario can do for you. So please fill the survey. You can find it um, on our website in the new section, uh, on our social media, on NI Society social media, on the CMF social media. Uh, the deadline is today, but uh, we will extend it if, uh, you know, if you need more time to respond. Uh, please do so. This is critical. Uh, it's unprecedented, uh, unprecedented times and uh, we need your feedback. Um, so the other thing that uh, we want to hear you about is uh, what you're doing. Many of us uh, are uh, giving back to the community right now. Uh, this morning, I was on the phone with somebody uh, who's uh, designing uh, a project uh, to raise funds from our industry. Uh, to raise funds, uh, to give back to uh, charities. I uh, was talking to other people who made their game free for a week, uh, other people who are looking at charities, uh, local charities uh, that they can help. There are many ideas like that, and uh, we want to hear about uh, your ideas and what you're doing uh, in terms of uh, helping uh, in these uh, uh, difficult times. Uh, so bear with me for a sec. I have pages. And I just want to make sure I go through uh, the important things I wanted to tell you. Um, so basically, uh, as I said, the information is going to help us uh, advocate at all levels of governments. Uh, so it's important to uh, get it uh, from you. Uh, and as I said, you can reach out to me directly at lucy at interactiveontario.com or advoca advocacy at interactiveontario.com. Uh, so I think I went through pretty much all I wanted to say, uh, but in the end, uh, we have to work together to make sure we don't lose too many jobs permanently and companies permanently. Uh, we were on a growth path. Uh, we were poised to be a leader worldwide. We've got to make sure that we're back in business uh, when uh, the crisis uh, is over. Uh, so Stephanie, I'm going to ask, are there any questions uh, in the YouTube channel? Um, we don't have any additional questions right now, um, but I would like to say to everyone, if you want to keep up to date, you can go to the website and subscribe to the Interactive Ontario newsletter, which we will be sending out updates uh, regularly through there. All right, so thank you all. Uh, and uh, stay safe. Thank you.